The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicine. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. So I'm going to cut to the chase here. I have a group business coaching intensive program that is open now. It will start in early April and it is a seven week program. It's one of the lowest investment programs that I offer. And it's an amazing group coaching program designed to help get your business off the ground, whether or not you have a business or you're already in business and you just want more clients doesn't really matter. This program is designed for both people without a business and people with a business. But if you feel stuck and you feel that you are having trouble getting in clients or don't know what to do next or don't even know where to start, then this program is for you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Medicine for These Times. I'm so happy to finally be connecting with Dr. Kat Meyer. Hi, Kat. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to. <laughs> I was just telling Kat, um, it's been interesting what always happens in the field. Right before this interview, just in the last few days, I have been either sent or told about personally um, multiple interesting stories about sex in the psychedelic space. So um, it's no coincidence we are speaking now. <laughs> we'll get into it. This is going to be a good juicy one. And I'm so excited to be finally connecting with you here. So Dr. Kat Meyer uh, is a licensed psychotherapist specializing in sex, trauma, and psychedelics. She's also a combo facilitator, author, teacher of yoga, and international speaker dedicated to, uh, to evolving the relationship we have surrounding sexuality and our bodies. Dr. Kat's clinical work with psychedelics combines her skills and knowledge of trauma, sex, and energy psychology. She approaches the work with her clients from a multi-layered and spiritual perspective for powerful activations and transformations. She's also the founder of sexloveyoga.com, an online platform integrating various schools of thought, including science, tantric yoga, indigenous ceremony culture, and psychology, designed to help people create a deeply fulfilling, prosperous, relational, and sexual life. As an expert and published researcher on the topic of sex, Dr. Kat sees clients in her private practice office in Beverly Hills and leads workshops, lectures, and retreats internationally. She is the host of the podcast, Sex Love Psychedelics and Erotically Wasted, author of the book, Sex Love Yoga, and co-founder of Undone Women's Central Yoga Experience. And you can check out her links right here in the show notes. But um, Dr. Kat, you know, I've heard a bit of your story, but for those that haven't heard about it, how did you get into this as a, you know, career, sex, doctor, psychedelics, yoga, this online platform, you know, there's, it's been so interesting to watch the explosion in this, um, you know, in the sex space, and then of course, in the psychedelic space. But yeah, what is your background? And did you know you were going to be doing this when you were, you know, 20 years old or a teenager? <laughs> Actually, I was 21. <laughs> 21. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so my background, um, I have some sexual, uh, sexual trauma from when I was younger, um, can, then leading into eating disorders and depression as a child and in my adolescence. And I really struggled with relationships. So you know, you've got some sex therapists who, who are just all about the sex and it was never an issue. But for me, I was terrified of it. Uh, relationships for me would last about a couple of weeks and then I would have pure panic. And it was like this internal fear that they would find out that I was bad, that I was innately bad, you know? And so I would shut them down. Any relationships that would move towards sexuality or touch, um, I would shut down. I would freeze. I would 
So I was 21 when I was reading a Red Book magazine, if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, aging myself. Um, and they were quoting a sex therapist. And I was like, you can do that? And I, it, I, it was in that moment where I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. I want to figure this out. I want to I, I want to feel differently about sex and around my body and relationships. I want to have relationships, you know, like uh, romantic relationships. And so that's when I applied to grad school and I dove in the academic route. And then along the way, um, I studied yoga, really dove into yoga, really felt this sense of um, like this extra piece of being able to calm my own body down and feel what that felt like. But then also like the, the, the spiritual aspect of, of yoga to be able to give me this, I didn't realize at the time, but this extra resource of, of power and of trust. Um, of course, that still took a long, you know, like many years of doing that work. And, um, and then from there, it was, I feel like I was just guided with what I was interested in. And it was only until retrospect that I was able to see how all these things interconnected. So ceremony work, metaphysical work, um, Reiki, energetic work, the yoga, the somatic therapy, you know, like the trauma therapy, and it all just kind of like came together, the Tantra, the BDSM, like I dove into all of these things because I'm, I'm, I have a very strong part of me that's like, we're interested in, let's dive in, let's go in there and learn it all and, and then be able to weave it all together. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. And I can't wait to get into these topics because they're some of my favorites. I'm curious, when was your first psychedelic experience and how did that, you know, play a part in, um, you know, maybe your previous sexual trauma or, you know, this path that you're on? I'm curious, like, did you, did something come up for you or was it over a period of time? Yeah. So I think I was 21 or 22. I think I was 22 when I tried mushrooms for the first time. It was in college. It was a beautiful Sunday Easter Sunday <laughs> with friends, yeah, and having that first sense of awe, you know, and, and the innocence. And I think I was um, in the grass with friends. We were making, putting sticks together and making a worm brothel. It was like <laughs> this most innocent, playful, you know, everything lifted. Uh, but then I didn't get into the ceremonial aspect of it until I was about 25 or 26. So after I had already been a student of Reiki and diving into the energetics and, and um, uh, more of the mystical side, then I got into this ceremonial. And I think ayahuasca was the first one that I, that I sat with. And so I tell this story about in that experience, going into the bathroom and looking into the mirror, I was washing my hands and I look up. And I made eye contact with myself. And then I just started touching my face and, and falling into the adorableness of myself and just be like, oh my God, I'm so cute. And I probably sat in there for a really long time, just like looking at myself and like petting myself and be like, I'm so cute, you know? And, and it reminds me in retrospect of this um, practice that we do in Tantra of transfiguration, you know, both you know, recognizing the divinity in something, but also the adorableness of something like true love and unconditional love is being able to look at a person and connect with how cute they are. They're so adorable in all of their, their parts, you know, and, and this was like a embodied reference point of that, of like, this is what you're working towards. This is what self love is and the recognition of this. Now, can you go back outside and do your integration or do your work towards this? And I don't think beforehand I actually knew what I was doing all this inner work for. It was like an intellectual concept of self-love, an intellectual concept of self-divinity, but here was like, oh, okay. Now we, now we just keep working towards coming back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can totally relate to this. I actually remember the first time where I had an awareness of like, oh, that's what true self-love feels like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on ayahuasca, it was, you know, the same thing. It was in a ceremony. And I remember it was that same, same feeling of like, how do I have this all the time in the, you know, the real world, the day to day? And uh -huh. it's not easy. It's really deep. And, um, you know, yeah. so it's interesting. I, 
I personally have been on this path for a very long time, but in my, I don't know, I think it was my first year, year and a half of drinking ayahuasca, I met a place in my body that was storing. So I knew my mom had sexual trauma that was, it, it was incest. It was pretty bad. And, um, but I always thought I was fine, you know, like, oh, that was hers. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. even though I had known about epigenetics and understood, you know, energy and I just really didn't think it was mine until it came up in a ceremony and I actually met where it was living in my own sacral chakra. And that is what got me going back for more. And it's been a deep healing journey to really like, and I think I, I would like to believe it's healed now, you know, who knows, but I'm curious, you know, in the work you're doing, are you doing work like this, like on such a deep cellular level? Like what is your viewpoint of how sexual trauma lives in our cells and our energy, our body? Because, you know, the reality is maybe it wasn't us, maybe it wasn't even our parents, but you know, I, I mean, ayahuasca, all these psychedelics have showed me even generations ago, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. if it happened in the family, maybe it happened in the family, you know, eons ago. What is it? Yeah. What is your viewpoint on on this? Because there's so many people yeah. coming to these medicines for deep healing now. Oh, my God. This is such a good question. And I see. So from my teachings, it's not that one of these things happens on one layer, energetic layer, you know, like this, it, the physical, the somatic is related to the emotional is related to the to the mental layer to related to the energetic layer. And these can be passed down through our, you know, epigenetics, not just the cellular level of like um, disrupted mitochondria, but also the burdens of the beliefs that we carry from our, from our ancestors, from our mom and her mom and her mom and her mom. Um, But also the, you know, how our body holds onto these as well. So oftentimes when I'm working with clients, they're, they are carrying the burdens of these lineages. And so they may or may not have experienced sexual trauma in this life. But then when they're in the space of the psychedelics, they will see how long that line goes. Um, Some of my clients who have a history or or who have a family um, uh, lineage in the Middle East or who have a black history. Sometimes I'll see that. They will see that. And so they'll be visited by their ancestors in that space, or they'll be able to see the whole line of where that comes from. And then to be able to associate some of their own fear responses that weren't their own because it didn't happen to them in this lifetime, but the way that their mom treated sex, the way that their mom shut down their vitality because they felt that their expression was dangerous because of what their mom had experienced. And so we can shut that down in our own selves and have, um, you know, block our own access to that for our safety, but not because we perceive that because our mom perceived that. Uh, And then when we can recognize what those are and unblock those or unburden those from ourselves, we can access what's called the golden shadow. Carl Jung talks about the golden shadow. And it's these parts of ourselves that we would identify as positive or lead to our vibrancy or our wholeness, but we've suppressed them for our own survival. And so I see that a lot a lot of times when they're from family lineage, yeah. Hmm. Oh my God, this is such a deep subject. Um, it's just so funny. I even went last night to this, um, I don't know, it was like some kind of tantric practice. It was blindfolded. It was very innocent, you know, clothes on. Mm-hmm. And it was so funny because in one hour I was like, wow, every single one of my core wounds just came up in like one hour. Like, and I could notice them and track them and just laugh. Um, but it's, it's just so deeply rooted in so many people, you know, and, and what do they say? Like one out of every four people has had some form of sexual abuse or maybe it's more. It's not more. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, like, what have you, you know, in your practice, especially let's say the last few years, there's a lot of intensity and the energies seem to be moving in the direction of people seeking, um, you know, alternative healings or healings with medicines or, you know, people willing to do this deeper work. But what do most of the people come to you for? Like, what is alive out there in the, the, the field of the realm that you work in? 
Yeah, I've been doing the the sex therapy work for 13 years. So I've seen a whole gamut of different challenges. Um, Most of the time what I get is sexual trauma, men, women, and other genders. Um, I see a lot of that. I see a lot of individuals who want to explore an openness or polyamory. Um, and so I, I get a lot of that, either people who are, who are curious or people who have tried it, shit hit the fan and now they didn't need help <laughs> from a uh, knowledgeable and non-judgmental space. Um, and then I also get individuals, ooh, this is a pattern that I've been seeing recently, is women coming in who are feeling like they're, they're coming into their sexual self. They're discovering who they are sexually and they're running up against the fear of their male partner who is afraid that now she's stepping into this, knowing what she wants, that she's going to leave them. I have seen this so many times recently. And I I think a part of that is because there's more knowledge. There's more uh, sex educators out there. There's more of the conversation around sexuality and there's it's peaking the curiosity of someone being like oh it doesn't have to be this way you know oh i oh there's something that i can feel differently or i don't want to feel suppressed anymore this low or somebody just turned me on outside of my relationship why do i feel this this way in my body i feel this tingly i feel this like urge to want to go and do that with that other person okay what's going on here You know, and so it's like waking up these feelings inside of our body and we're following the curiosity rather than just shutting it down. Um, So that's been really interesting. Or also uh, a lot of people, there's a lot more people who have been curious about BDSM lately. I've seen so many people now wanting to become dominatrixes or wanting to tie each other up. And I'm like, yes, I've been waiting for this moment all my life and for everybody to join me in that space, the sacred kink. Um, And yeah, so I think psychedelics also help us there. You know, psychedelics helps us to redefine what reality is, what conscious awareness is. They help us to break through the confines of how we self-identify, but then they also help us to redefine what sex is. Like how many people have had a full body orgasm in, in ayahuasca or with the psilocybin. And then they're like, what is this? You know, and I just had the best sex of my life with five MEO and nobody even touched me. <laughs> so it's, it's cracking open this culturally co- defined idea of what sex is. And then what do we do that? Where do we put that in the file folder of what we understand our life to be? We can't because it doesn't fit there. And so we've got to go somewhere. And now we start asking the questions. I love this. It's like everything is being reprogrammed. (laughs) It's happening. Um, Because it's it's been fascinating just even my own journey and then working with clients for years. And I'm not even doing anything in these realms. But I've had a lot of clients, you know, in the... um, Tantra, sacred sexuality, a lot of clients working in the trauma space and, you know, these things surface. And it is very interesting to see how psychedelics fit into this. Um, This is why I was telling Kat in 2019, I actually posted on Facebook. I'm like, who's talking about sex and psychedelics out there? And back then, I think I was given like two names. Um, So I'm really glad you're out there talking about it because I had even noticed, okay, well, you know, some thoughts are coming up and I know there was programming that was given to me by this, by my family, by this society, this world. And there's all these other ways and there's more and more people um, out there, you know, very public and being emp- empowered by it. You know, let's say the non-monogamy and polyamorous space, um, but so much more beyond that. So I'm yeah. curious, where does psychedelics fit into this work that you're doing? Is it, you know, I'm sure people, or maybe it's just me projecting, um, all I can think is like, oh, maybe she just gives MDMA to couples and like sits there and hangs out with them. But is it, <laughs> is, it <laughs> is it just MDMA or is it something else or is it you doing psychedelic therapy or people doing it on their own? I'm curious, like, what's uh, what's the work you do around the psychedelics and what else is um, happening out there in this this kind of sex psychedelic world? Yeah. So clinically, because I'm a licensed therapist, I work with ketamine and ketamine 
I think a lot of people look at that and they're like, that's not sexy or I can't have sex on that. Like my dick goes down or whatever. I don't know. But, or I can't find my body. Uh, but again, redefining what sex is. And when I was in my ketamine assisted therapy program, uh, we were doing the experiential with lozenge. And I was like, my intention is to see how I can use this for sex therapy. And I went into the experience. And as the ketamine started coming onto my body, I was like, okay, can I find my body? Okay, I can. I can feel my body. It feels light. I feel, you know, like this expansiveness. And then I was like, okay, can I connect with my pelvis and my pussy? And I was like, Ooh, I can, I can feel it. Okay. What happens if I start breathing and moving my body like I do in my tantric practices? And I started doing that and I shot into a full body orgasm and my whole body was shaking and shivering and, and just, you know, rolling with that energy. And so now we come into the integration circle and this room is full of doctors and therapists and other practitioners and everybody looks at me and they're like, okay, what did, we want whatever you had, right? <laughs> and it, it, it draws me into the reminder that, you know, in this space, in the ketamine specifically, it, it is energetic experience of our eroticism and it reminds us that sex can be energetic. And that if we lift the heaviness of depression or anxiety for somebody to be able to be in their bodies or with their bodies in a way that they wouldn't otherwise be able to because of trauma or because of these um, uh, chronic pain or challenges, it can help them to realize that, that they can access uh, you know, the energy of sex, that it doesn't have to be the physical aspect of it. So can that help them redefine that? And I've had clients who are um, trans and who do not want to be in their body because of the uh, dysmorphia, and then realizing that they can turn themselves on or they can access pleasure still in a safer way, in this in this way, um, and and then to be able to work backwards from that, and then getting into tantra and you know then being able to integrate with energetic experiences instead of just the physical functioning of their body. Um, and then in my clinical office, you know, it's using breath and sound and instruments to help people to feel and connect. And I use lower dose, lower to um, medium dose of lozenge so somebody can still connect with their body. I'm not giving them high IM or IV to shoot off somewhere. I want them with their body. And so their body and with the energy of it. And so uh, so many times clients have been able to connect with the pleasure or to connect with their body in a kinder, safer way or to be able to recognize the blocks that are preventing them from being able to maintain an orgasm or um, um, erection or libido. And this is any genders. So I can see it in that way to be really powerful. Then I also help individuals with the preparation the education and then the integration of exploring with psychedelics, whether it's psilocybin or MDMA or otherwise, to help them to be able to safely, ethically, consensually explore in that realm and then how to integrate and create a plan out of that. So I know people are experiencing or um, experimenting with these different psychedelics, but they can. there's a lot of harm that's happening people who are getting hurt, people who are getting violated, and then also people who are experimenting with it, having the best sex of their lives, but then not knowing how to actually change their sex. <laughs> They're just having a great time on it. But it's like, okay, but now we can take that even deeper and see what you learned in that experience and then integrate it in your everyday sex life so you don't keep having to outsource it to drugs and psychedelics to get to that space, but you can actually have psychedelic sex outside of a medicine. That is it. Um, because I, it's interesting. I was, I actually just released an episode um, with someone who does some ketamine and I, I told him I don't actually platform a lot of people who just do ketamine therapy because I, you know, I know it's great for certain things, but I am more about okay. um, embodiment and really feeling and getting into the feelings and bringing it into 
the the integrated body that's human that's here on earth and not so much the dissociation um which is great what you say and it's fascinating i've never even thought about that that you could actually work with ketamine to actually train yourself to feel more because it is so easy to just like you know turn into the blob and yeah lose it all (laughs) and um but i'm so glad you just said what you said about learning how to actually you know, work with your body to bring this into your everyday experience, because I have seen this, you know, it's, it's, it's been challenging being in this space and the psychedelic space and the, the kind of, you know, the festival community, the community, everybody's like, oh, it's psychedelic forward, you know, but at the same time, I, I have met people that really do depend on um, only being in an altered state to have a great relationship or great sexual experiences. And I'm like, well, you know, is that really the answer? Same with ketamine, even, you know, people needing ketamine once or mm-hmm. twice a week just to have an everyday life. You know, um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that because I really believe it's, you know, these, these medicines are here to help us, you know, get into our body and learn, like you said. Um, so thank you so much for sharing about this and, Wow, I'm pretty blown away. That is incredible. Um, but let's speak a little bit about, you know, this this kind of darker side that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And um, it's been interesting. You know, I had something happen a, a little over a year ago where I, I asked people on Facebook about tr- a, a particular kind of transgression with a, a therapist and, um, you know, like falling in love with your client, which, you know, there's 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 definitely ethical boundaries um the psychedelic space in particular hasn't really established concrete ethical boundaries yet you know because it's still very underground um you know of course if you're a licensed therapist there are i do have to say it was interesting it was one of the um, probably my most popular facebook posts ever uh the amount Mm -hmm. of comments was just incredible but the comments ranged from like no this should never be like this to let humans be humans and do whatever they want. And it's, it's, and I've actually struggled with this too, you know, in the psychedelic space, I don't know. I mean, it's like, well, who's to say what's right or wrong. Maybe it is okay if someone falls in love with someone on MDMA and then they end up together the rest of their life. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, But how do you navigate this? And like, what do you recommend to people, especially by the way, there's a lot of underground people who, you know, there's sexual trauma comes up unexpectedly very often. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are your views on, on what's happening in the medicine space? Cause it is getting weird and there's more and more stories every day. And, you know, I, Beth, I am going to be so blunt with this answer because I feel so strongly about this as a trauma therapist who has also been in this space. The, question here, first of all, is, are we recognizing that there is always a power differential when there is a facilitator and someone seeking healing? So it is not an equal playing ground. And so what archetype are we as the person seeking healing, looking at the facilitator as? As our savior, as our mother, to come and nurture us and take care of us as our father, to come and protect us, to save us, to take us out of our pain? Are we looking to them and giving up our power? Are we selling them our power in exchange for the illusion of safety or the illusion of love or the illusion of something that we feel we aren't having or able to source for ourselves? And then the question to the facilitator, what are we How are we seeing this person as something that is trying to, um, you know, heal our own selves? Or what are what what are we asking them to step into for us? What are we getting from this? Oftentimes it's power. It's more power. You know, even as someone who is nurturing, you are in a power role of that you can offer to this other person. You can take care of them, you can save them, you can, they look up to you, whatever it is. And so add sex or add love to this. And then the question is, what is love? You know, in MDMA and in in, um, ayahuasca, we all can feel love. We can feel the vibration of it. We can feel the omnipresence of it, but then 
we, this is a human and the human across from us, uh, what are we projecting onto them? We do not have enough evidence. We do not have enough experience to be able to trust them or to know whether they're a right fit for relationship. So our desire always precedes the amount of experience that we need with a person. And that can be enough to um, alter our discernment. So on both roles. Now, I don't want to put that responsibility on the person who is healing because they are vulnerable. It really falls on the responsibility of all the facilitators. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Do your work. This needs to be clean. This needs to be clean so that our, the students, our, our um, uh, clients have the space, the safety to project, to fall apart, to, uh, to find their own selves. And we're here to hold a safe container that does not move, that is not you know, uh, altered by that so that they can find their own sense of self and containment and, and power and then grow and move on. And so that's what I really want to emphasize. It's not safe if, if we're allowing ourselves to get, get into this and then say, well, we're well, just being human. <laughs> you know, it, It's going to create, it already has created so much um, trauma, so much pain, so much. Um, I was dating somebody at one point and he called me from the airport and said, I have fallen in love with my shaman and now I'm going to go be in a relationship with her. And I was like, all right, the irony of this, because I literally talk about this on podcasts and here's some information from, uh, from chakruna.org, you know, about how sex and relationships and, you know, end up in ceremony cultures. So um, I would love to put this holy responsibility on facilitators. And unfortunately, we've got to educate the people who are seeking help too. I'm sorry, you should not be holding that as a responsibility. But let me tell you that, you know, boundaries are important. Clean energy is important. You, you know, um, and unfortunately, we, we see this a lot. Wow. Classic, by the way. Classic yeah. that, that that happened to you. Because um, I was telling Kat off camera. Uh, my former partner also um, crossed ethical boundaries and, you know, um, it, <laughs> I'm not associated with that person anymore. And it was very fascinating to be in that space to actually question like, well, wait a second, what are the ethical boundaries? And like, and, and really, you know, as I was telling Kat off camera, um, some people definitely from the sex positive, uh, you know, polyamory crowd that I'm friends with was like, they're all for humans being humans. And so I started to question like, well, how do we know what's right or wrong? But yeah, if someone's coming to you for healing, especially by the way, in the psychedelic space where there's a huge power dif differential, right? Then there's, yeah. it's even more, um, you know, enhanced and increased where, you know, if there's MDMA or, you know, even mushrooms or whatever it is, anything, it's like, it's, it takes even more of this personal responsibility and thank thankfully the education. And it's been so fascinating working in this space um, and sad, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. to see how much has come up. I mean, there's story mm -hmm. after story. And even I, I was just telling Kat, even in the last like week and a half, I've been sent a couple articles. I heard a couple firsthand accounts. I mm -hmm. talked yeah. to someone like two days ago. I mean, it's been... And I don't know. I don't know what to make out of it other than, wow, it's sickening and it's scary and it's a wild west. And, um, you know, the education around this is so important because, as you said, it's like there's this projection, there's transference, there's yeah. the power differential. And I think um, I personally don't even know if some of these like training programs teach any of this. I think a lot of them um, kind of avoid this section because yeah. it's so sensitive. I'm curious, like, what are your experiences with that? Like, have you, because even my former partner who is a somatic therapist, sure. he had even told me the four, he did a four-year training program with two additional years and neither program touched on sexual trauma, which I thought was a what? very strange, I know, isn't that weird? <laughs> That's so weird because so much of the trauma that we experience or that we see is is sex-related, which 
you know, I, I think it's an underservice to see um, or a disservice to see how little is talked about and trained. Um, I'm not saying everybody needs to become a sex therapist, but we do need to be able to uh, do our own attitude reassessment to see what sort of blocks and barriers and projections and bias and then um, our own internal needs that I mean, we all have different relationships around sex. And for some of us, we use sex as a way to create safety or to create belonging or to create worth. And so if we're not doing that work with understanding our own relationship around it, it becomes dangerous. Um, I had a colleague years ago. She did. She published research on um, therapists who had sex with their clients um, or developed relationships with their clients. And one of the one of the the contributing contacts was they were not getting their own sex needs met or their own self-worth worked on um, outside of their therapy. So they were, they were doing that work through their clients and that's so dangerous. It's really dangerous. And, you know, to speak to the individuals who say, um, let's let humans be humans. You know what? Yes, let's all be human. However, there is shadow that if we aren't doing the work to become conscious and bring into the light, then we're gonna, you know, that's why all these things are happening. I'm not here to shame anybody, but if we aren't taking responsibility as the sexual revolution, the psychedelic revolution happens and continues to change and transform us, this causes chaos and chaos can harm. Chaos can be beautiful and it can create, but only with the container of, you know, holding knowledge, safety, presence, uh, in that as well. Yeah, and thank you so much for educating people about this. I, I mean, I'm curious, in your experience, you know, have you been hearing more and more of these stories from people in the medicine world, in the medicine space? And then also, I don't know, um, you know, I've heard some mixed things about like the level of training that people are getting around the, even just the very, ba like, I'm a business coach and I know about transference, you know, like um, <laughs> even just the very basics. I'm like, do people even know the basics? Um, but I'm curious, like, what are you witnessing out there in, in maybe the psychedelic space or even the, the sexuality or even the, the crossover of the two? Like, yeah. are you starting to hear some horror stories or are you seeing people being properly trained or I mean, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I am. And um, I've even had uh, called people forward on podcasts even <laughs> because of this. Um, people who are telling me that they're dabbling in using ketamine and um, internal vaginal work and or um, body work and being um, not having the proper etiquette for the consent and understanding that you know, ketamine and MDMA and some of these other psychedelics can increase the threshold of what we will tolerate or what we'll be okay with, will override our, our boundaries, and then experience the trauma of our body um, afterward. Uh, I see this also a lot. Of, I get clients who are in the um, poly open uh, play parties, open swinger worlds, and use drugs or use psychedelics to, over, again, override these boundaries. And then they're coming in and they're complaining about these UTIs or they just start bawling and they don't know why. And then we back it up and we see they keep overriding themselves. But their body is, is remembering that. You know, there's something going on. Their body's reacting because, yeah, you can overcome it in the mind. But then, you know, this was a line for a reason. Um, then... I think with psychedelics, we can get into this space of like, I know the truth. I have certainty, you know, it has that unique perspective of the mind to be able to make everything like, okay. And like, oh yeah, I've just been given the keys to the universe. I know that you and I were pharaohs and a queen in Egypt time. And so therefore we need to be you know, together now. And like my hands, my sexual hands can heal you and whatever. And, and it's like that conviction piece is very scary, too, because if that's how people, um, especially people who are vulnerable, have sexual traumas or traumas in their background that make discernment really challenging and they don't know what's right or wrong or they can more likely um, 
follow somebody who has discernment because discernment is powerful. It feels really certain. It feels really strong. And they're like, oh my God, you were touched by God. And like, God gave you this answer. So therefore, you know, we need to do this thing. Um, in the Tantra world, in the, in really in every single community, there is the person who takes this and takes advantage of vulnerable populations. And um, while there's no regulating bodies for underground, there is for as for clinicians or licensed clinicians for underground, there isn't. So I think really it falls to the responsibility of community and community call forward people on their behavior and hold them accountable rather than what I see over and over is people not saying something, people talking about it behind the, you know, behind their backs, but not doing anything. And I think it, re it reminds me of the psychological fear that we all hold of not belonging or confronting somebody and then somebody dismissing us or minimizing or um, saying that we're wrong. And I have had that experience. I have confronted people in their sexual discretions and, and um, violations. And their responses back was, I was shaming them. I was not in loving kindness. I was uh, projecting onto them. And I had to rally the community behind me and have multiple people sit this person down. Uh, at first I crumbled, but then <laughs> once I was able to find my own strength again, I, I called people forward and they got to see the seriousness of this instead of minimizing and um, giving rationality of this person that is not. So it's like we over rationalize, we over -compa be compassionate. We're like, oh, this person is just blah, 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 or oh, this is just love. But we've got to really be a lot more firm with this. When it comes to sex, when it comes to psychedelics, this is where it gets blurry and, and people can get hurt. Oh, I'm going to send this interview to so many people, by the way, because um, it's 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 very strange. I personally have actually gotten people booking calls with me to explore in my programs who then have come out and told me about transgressions. And it's, yeah. you know, it's been an interesting experience for me where I'm like, well, great. Now I'm holding this. And, um, you know, do I bring it forward? I encourage them to bring it forward, but it's the exact thing you mentioned. It's the same story every time, you know, the, they were then told by the people they confronted that it was them, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. it's, and then there's a fear of, um, losing livelihood. You know, a lot of times it's, it's literally like their, it's their business and their business is underground and it's referral based. And if they upset, you know, the one kind of ringleader in charge or, you know, people interconnected to that person that's been sending them clients, they lose their livelihood. And I have now had numerous stories, um, you know, out there in this space around this. And it's like you said, it's how do we come forward, you know, community. Um, there are some whistleblower publications and, and people out there that are, you know, telling the stories, but it's been challenging because there is no governing body. Um, and then people <laughs> really doubt themselves. And then, like you said, that deep fear of like, well, I'm going to lose my community, my friends, potentially mm -hmm. my whole business. And yep. then what? So then they're stuck in this place and then they're traumatized and then they're serving from trauma. And, um, you know, it's, I know this is going to come up so much more. Your business is, you're already, you're already out there doing huge work. I'm like, this is going to blow up so big because I keep wondering what's on the horizon with MDMA therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we all know it's, I think it's due out this year or they keep saying it's yeah. this year. Um, and I'm, assuming it's, you know, trained therapists, but MDMA is a very powerful substance, you know, yeah. it's, of course you fall in love with everybody. Um, <laughs> you know, how do you feel that we can get this right? Like, is there, I mean, I, I do believe, yeah, humans, like there's ego and there's, you know, this is not new. Um, it's mm -hmm. right. It's like billions of years old at this point, but is there a possibility of us getting these the, the healing powers of these medicines and sexual healing to people um, and and trying to also be human and get this right? Like, have you come up with any solutions? You know, like you said, community. But even then, like, how do we yeah. do this in community when people are living in such fear? Yes, I believe if you are a facilitator or if you are a therapist, do not be a silo. Do not be doing this work by yourself. 
have a um, have a group that you have consult with, like a consultation group. Um, have your own therapist or coach or, or somebody who is also helping you with your transference, your counter transference, your your uh, relationships around sex, your boundaries, your needs, so that you're not working on those through your clients un- unconsciously, unintentionally. Um, and then I also really believe in the group model for therapy for many reasons, um, reasons of uh, financial reasons, you know, because many, much of this work isn't affordable for uh, especially working with really good practitioners, <laughs> you know, rightfully so, they're expensive. And so how can we make this more affordable? But also we can really learn from each other in these group models. You know, it, it, it decentralizes the power from just the facilitator and includes everybody as a as a wisdom keeper their own wisdom keeper that we can learn from each other Um, but then it also helps to create safety around the ethical aspects i don't mean that it completely eliminates it because you know transgressions happen in ceremony circles too but it does reduce that and so i think there's something really powerful and potent about that Um, As this relates to sexuality, I've been leading retreats for about 10 years now. And so I've seen group models in this um, be really, really beautiful, learning from each other, seeing reference points of this woman moving in this way or this person sounding in this way or listening to their story and being able to relate with it and that being healing or being witnessed. The power of being witnessed in your story, your psychedelic story, in integration afterward, or even, um, you know, being witnessed in in your story in the experience is really powerful. Um, I also think it creates community. And if we aren't in community, it makes integration so much harder. And so if we bond in this experience together and then we're facilitated or, or, um, supported in that continuing on, then that can help us to be able to step into the version of ourselves or step into the qualities and the, um, the story that we would prefer ourselves to be. I think that's really important. So right now I'm running ketamine retreats for women and uh, creating that model where they're connecting beforehand. There's prep work beforehand, as well as the retreat, as well as integration, and then coming up with plans to continue the work, because we know that it falls off with integration so much. And of course, like integration is hard. Like, <laughs> why do we want to keep doing the work, you know? But like the, the psychedelic, the ketamine, the MDMA is the tool that we keep coming back to, to reference. And, and so having a plan to help us to be able to move through that having a community to hold us accountable, having that, you know, to extend beyond just the powerful experience is what we need. So I feel really strongly about, you know, yeah, this this group model, but also I've been building out like ways that people can integrate. I've got online programs. I've got monthly embodiment practices. I've got, you know, these ways that people can keep the work going long after whatever experience that they have. Yeah, huge. Yeah. And community has come up um, so much for years. And I, I, I think more and more people are seeing this, that we, you know, no one's meant to do this alone. And when we do have that accountability, um, also, you know, you mentioned this, the supervision. I think that's something that also, again, this is not regulated, but facilitators or people doing underground work need to have their own, their own day-to-day practice, their own integration, their own um, guidance, you know, someone to turn to as well. And I, you know, this, this makes me wonder, um, you know, if someone's maybe looking to heal their sexual trauma um, and maybe work with psychedelics, what are some questions they can ask the facilitators that they're going to? Because, of course, everybody says that they heal trauma. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, you know, it's also interesting, too. I get DMs, questions from people like, hey, my friend just decided to be, be a facilitator of psilocybin. They haven't done any trainings and I'm scared that they're doing this. What should I say to them? So I made a guide that helps people to vet their practitioners and they can get that on my website, either sexloveyoga.com or sexlovepsychedelics.co for that free guide. 
Um, and it has these different questions to ask. And I think it's important for anybody facilitating to also ask those questions of yourself so that you can make sure you're in, in, in integrity of both what you're selling and what you are, um, uh, what you're, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, appropriate to, <laughs> to hold, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In integrity of holding. Um, competency, that's the word I'm looking for, mm -hmm. competent to hold. So uh, what's their experience? What's their training in trauma? I think a lot of people are saying trauma informed, but you got to know what that means because it's a buzzword at this point. And people are saying, oh, I'm trauma informed. They read uh, The Body Keeps Score. <laughs> that's not trauma informed. I say, informed. I say they read Instagram posts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. No, <laughs> it's, just, it's not. It's it's beautiful. These are great books. But it, it's it, to be called a trauma therapist or trauma facilitator or trauma informed facilitator. That takes a lot of work, years of work. It's not just a month long training that you take because the nuance and the subtleties that trauma shows up in the body, the way trauma can be re-triggered the way trauma can be prevented from actually changing. Like these are these are very real skills. You gotta have deep presence if you're working with somebody with trauma. Cause it'll happen in a split second where you want if you're not catching something because you're in your own head or you're trying to analyze them, like you're gonna miss it. <laughs> so deep presence, deep attuning, and you know, checking your own stuff that you might be projecting onto them. Um, following your client rather than leading your client, you know, letting your client have an inner wisdom that you that you hold, that you watch for, that you attune, that you support, but you're not you're not leading them down something. You're following them. So it's yeah, asking them about their training, um, asking them about their lineage of of work. You know whether. Who did they study with? How long did they study with? What's their relationship with the medicine? Um, do they have a consultation group supervision? You know, what does that look like? Um, and if somebody doesn't want to answer these questions or they don't have an answer to this question, you know, sit with your own self and see whether that works for you. Because <laughs> I'm not here to say, you know, I'll tell you that you can't work with somebody, but just be consciously aware of what you're getting yourself into. And if we're going in to do this deep work, I personally want somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing, <laughs> you know? who can hold me in the most like uh, dissolved, falling apart, chaotic space and know that they got me. Ah, uh, thanks. No? thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and I agree. It's like deep discernment, people, you know, like really deep knowing yourself and knowing what you need and your boundaries and um, you know, and, and hey, if you decide to work with someone that you're not 100% comfortable with, then know what you're getting into. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. feel thank your you. body. Yeah. Yeah. Trust your body and your feeling with All them right. and how they're answering. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm like, I always tell this story. I'm like, the one time where I knew I should have walked out and I didn't, I regretted it, you know? And it's I had those two. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been there at least once. Um, but I, I'm curious to know, um, you know, it's been interesting being in this coaching world for a long time and seeing the increase of, you know, Tantra, sacred sexuality coaches, um, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's been interesting because again, I always take this kind of Buddhist approach of like, you know, who's to say what's right or wrong. And it's kind of scary. And I've, I've had clients work in this space and I've seen, um, you know, people go to an Easter week, a week of Easter mm -hmm. and then become yeah. sex coaches the next day. Um, where is this all going? You know, part of me is excited because we're in this, you know, big sexual revolution, this liberation of our, um, you know, feminine power or, or just all, you know, inner power that's sexual energy inside of us. But, um, it's also sometimes very, um, you know, like hard. It's kind of like the psychedelic space. It's like, whoa, it's a lot. Um, and I have friends who've been actually working in this space for a long time who are constantly calling out, you know, the dime a dozen Tantra coaches or, um, you know, the, the transgressions in that world. But do you think there's something bigger happening here? Like, is this, 
going in the right direction for the good of the planet? Like, where do you see this kind of, um, this, this world of sexuality going? And like, what does it all mean? Like, what's a, what is it a part of? I'm curious. (laughs) (laughs) Such a good question. I love this one because this actually isn't new. We have seen this happen Um, In the recent history, we see a sexual revolution happen about every 50 years. So we can look back to the 60s and 70s. We can take it back to the Roaring Twenties. We can take it back even further. There's uh, whatever 50 years ago was before that. (laughs) I'm not good at math. Um, But we can see how these sexual revolutions happen. Um, and it, and a lot of people have free love and expansion. And a lot of this is also tied with, you know, increase of psychedelics or substance use that causes this inhibition, people coming into more of their expression and, and sexuality is aliveness, you know, sexuality is our life force energy. And so we reduce the inhibitions and we, and we have all of this. Um, and some of this is chaotic too, you know, and like, Chaos, again, can be creative. It can also be destructive if there's not the responsibility and the container and the knowledge and the support of that. Um, All of these in the recent history we've seen come after a period of repression or the period of trauma in our collective world. You know, if we look at the 60s and 70s that came right after the war and, you know, the, um, the 50s, the very repressed, like very like, uh, I'm not going to use the word traditional roles, but more of like, you know, the set roles of how you're supposed to be buttoned up. Um, And then recently we we saw like or and then it got shut down again because of the, the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. You know, and then the same thing happened here. We had the pandemic happen. And a lot of people like their sexuality, you know, more play parties, more psychedelic use. And so we're seeing that rise again. It's nothing new. And and I think these patterns are going to continue to happen. We even saw this in ancient times because there are accounts of fertility rites being used in ancient cultures, ancient Samaria, Egypt, you know, um, uh, uh, Greece. And, you know, seeing the rise of the use of psychedelics in these spaces and and, um, sexuality or, um, you know, fertility rites for the fertility of land and, you know, whatever. We've seen all of that. And then we also saw that destroyed with the coming of like the um, uh, crusades and, you know, the the shutting down from the patriarchal and the religious cultures to, to shut it down. And so this isn't new. We've seen this. It's going to rise. It's going to, I believe it's going to, you know, uh, go through its cycle again, death and rebirth. Um, however, just because that's what the collective world does, doesn't mean that we on the micro levels have to do the same thing. Like, I think we can, um, continue to open and open and open and not fall down into the, you know, the cycle, cycle of repression again, individually, Mm -hmm. individually. Uh, now that does require us to be able to create our own container our own self-regulation tools, our own conscious awareness of our patterns, of our shadows, of how we use sexuality. Why are we in this work? You know, just because you access your sexuality and you feel really juicy in your body does not mean that you then become a facilitator, like bless your heart. If that's what you want to do, okay. However, be in the contemplation of why am I doing this? What are the parts of me that are getting met or uh, um, needs met in being this facilitator identifying myself as this. I remember my therapist asked me that years ago um, when I was working with him, he was like, what parts of you are getting your needs met through being a therapist or being a trauma therapist specifically? And and I had got to sat, sit with, oh, what is it in me that wants to hold the deep, dark depths of all these people? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> what am I getting out of this? You know, and or what? And, and reality is, yeah. What am I getting out of this? Um, and I got to meet a part of me that's deeply uh, programmed to to be in crisis with people, like develop relationships with people who are deeply in crisis because it brought real pure presence. You know, there's like a as a deep, strong presence with people who are in crisis, and they're right there with you, and they're like 
do you got me? So I got to do a lot of work around that. <laughs> and learn. Yeah, yeah. But like, if we're denying that, then we're missing a whole thing. And we're just, it, it, we're missing a whole thing. And then, and then we're upset when we're not getting that from our clients. When we're not getting the, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, that we're um, outsourcing to them or to the world. So like, if you're not willing to do your own shadow work, golden shadows and all, I'm not saying shadow work as in dive into the dumpster to dig out the heavy, dirty shit, like, great, but also like just the wholeness of this, then we're doing a disservice <laughs> and, and we may fall right back into the cycle that I just talked about uh, after the revolution. Ah, such great points. Oh my God, this has been an amazing interview. Very timely too. Um, so Dr. Kat, I want to leave you uh, time to talk about, you know, where people can find you. We do have your links here in the show notes, but what do you have coming up and what are your What's on your mm -hmm. radar for the next, uh, you know, six to 12 months or so? Yeah. So I do um, uh, the ketamine retreats for women. Um, that'll be in May will be this upcoming one. Um, <clears throat> I work with a, with a medical doctor as well. We have a great team and, and um, uh, incorporating a lot of like embodiment and connecting the relationship with the body. Um, then I also do monthly workshops called undone for women and it's really about undoing the negative messages around their bodies um, using yoga breath work and dance and that i think i believe as an integration tool for us you know again we touch on these things and then how do we keep that practice going um, and then just really i'm i'm really focusing on building out uh communities for integration i think that's where we're missing in this world a lot of people want to be facilitators and they just want the person to have the breakthrough and then leave them. But I want to be like, okay, let's create the infrastructure for the for the continuing work, the integration. Um, yeah, that's what I'm most excited about. Ah, uh, and yes, I agree with that last part very much. It's like the, the facilitators are a dime a dozen. You know, not to diminish them, some are amazing, yeah. and um, it's not gonna. It's I always say it's useless without the integration. Mm -hmm. It's nice, but it doesn't really make the change. So yes, um, yeah. integration community, integration coaches, specialists, it's time. So Dr. Ka, this was really amazing. So timely, so necessary. I'm going to be sending this to a lot of people. Um, <laughs> it's probably going to come up a lot. Might even have to bring you back on as we go deeper into the the interesting wild west of the psychedelic space. But you know, I have a lot of faith that Hopefully things are going in a, a more positive direction and we'll, we'll see what happens. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you so much. This was great. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review and check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times.